This program is sponsored in part by the Elizabethtown College Summer Scholarship, Creative Arts, and Research Projects. Elizabethtown College, educate for service. And then we're now trying to develop new techniques. I mean, I'm saying we in the sense of cosmology, um, trying to develop techniques of looking at what was going on just before that, that wall. Uh, can we see perhaps uh, the effects of you know, gravity, gravitational waves coming out from just before that, that wall? And every time you do this, you push our, you know, our ignorance back a little bit further in time. And you hope that that will give you clues as to what went on just before and just before to the point that maybe you can dissolve the mystery. You know, maybe you can actually get to the point that you understand how did our universe start. Recall there are two components of dynamical explanation, laws and initial conditions. In our experiments, we control the initial conditions, so all we need are the laws to explain the phenomena in question. But when the subject to be explained is the history of the entire universe, we are necessarily left to account for the initial conditions. Here's a quick overview of general relativistic cosmology, that is, Big Bang cosmology. Uh, let me give a quick overview of Big Bang cosmology. It's a solution from Einstein's equations obtained by making a simplifying assumption that space-time can be foliated into spatial hypersurfaces of homogeneity, same everywhere, and isotropy, looks the same in every direction. If you do that, instead of having 10 partial differential equations, nonlinear, coupled in the 10 metric functions of four variables each, you end up with just two ordinary differential equations and two functions, and your metric only has one function of one variable. Now, the other function that you have to find is this density function, energy density, is a function of time. We're looking at what's called the dust-filled solution, and there we have no pressure and no momentum fluxes. All we have is energy density, literally dust distributed everywhere throughout space, homogeneously and isotropically. Okay, so what is this function telling us here? Well, if you think about the galaxies as having coordinates, spatial coordinates affixed to them, so that as space may expand or contract, you can see that the individual galaxies maintain their same location on the coordinate grid. But the distance does, in fact, change. And that's precisely what this function does right there. It tells you how locations that are fixed in that dust change as a function of time. Now, when you set up the Einstein's equations, it turns out that there are three possible shapes there for that space. It can be flat, positively curved, or negatively curved like a saddle. And we're going to look at the flat case solution, the dust-filled flat case, called the einstein de Sitter solution. Here are your x, y, and z over your three-dimensional flat Euclidean space. This is your scaling factor. Here's your Ricci tensor components, your scalar curvature. Here's your Einstein tensor 0, 0. Of course, T0, 0, 0 is the only non-zero component of your stress-energy tensor. Here's G11. T11, and you get these two differential equations. Again, you have to solve in your scaling factor as a function of time and your density, energy density as a function of time. We're interested in this solution. And uh, second order differential equation. So you get the picket's value at two different times to come up with a particular solution. Typically, today's value is chosen to be one. And typically at t equals zero, a is chosen to be zero. And that's the big bang right there. When you look at all the solutions for the different three different shapes, here are your saddle shapes, you get all these possible solutions. And here's your sphere shapes, you get all these solutions. And you have just this one solution corresponding to the flat case. And it seems to be the case that our cosmology follows the flat case, and that's called the flatness problem. When you have all these choices and all these choices otherwise, 
Why is it that our universe seems to follow so nicely just the flat case? Uh, you can get rid of the singularity here at t equals zero, I will point out before closing, uh, by just choosing a to be non-zero at t equals zero. And you might justify that as we do, for example, with the stop point problem in reggae calculus. But I'll leave that for our book to explain. We don't need that here. As Will Chick said, the account dynamical explanation gives, things are what they are because they were what they were, raises the question, why were things that way and not any other? Besides the puzzle of the Big Bang proper, we have the low entropy problem uh, articulated by Penrose. There's a very big puzzle about the initial state of the universe, which is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is telling you that things are getting more random, if you like. Well, that doesn't seem so unreasonable, but if you go back in time, this means that it was less and less random, more and more special, the earlier you go back in time. So the Big Bang, in a certain sense, must have been more special than anything else that we know in the universe. Additionally, we have the flatness problem and the horizon problem. Planck 2015 data find that the universe is spatially flat to less than five parts in a thousand. Using a cosmological parameter from general relativistic cosmology called omega, we would say that the current value of omega is between 0.995 and 1.005, where omega equals one means the universe is spatially flat. The spatially flat model resides precisely between all possible positively curved and negatively curved models, just as I showed. So it is a very unique situation. And in order for space to be as close to flat as it is now, omega must have been much closer to one earlier in time. For example, just one second after the Big Bang, it must have been the case that omega was between 0.9999999999995 and 1.0000000000005. That's 13 nines and 13 zeros. Hopefully I counted right. Why does this extremely unique situation obtain? That is the flatness problem. The last mystery is the homogeneity of the source of the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is radiation assumed to have been emitted or freed from scattering when the universe was only 380,000 years old. This is called recombination. Here's a nice explanation from Timothy Ferris in The Creation of the Universe from 1985. Once the universe had been expanding for about one million years, it had thinned out enough so that photons could fly freely through space without constantly running into other particles. The result was the dawn of light. This was also the date of the birth of the first atoms. Free at last from harassment by the photons, electrons could settle down in orbit around atomic nuclei. One electron orbiting one proton gives you an atom of hydrogen the simplest and most abundant of all the elements. Two electrons orbiting a pair of protons plus a couple of neutrons gives you a tidy little atom of helium. After being freed from scattering, the background radiation cooled by the expansion of the universe to its present temperature of 2.725 Kelvin. As it turns out, the temperature of the cosmic microwave background is the same in all directions to within 0.002 Kelvin, uh, two parts in a thousand. This implies that the temperature of matter and radiation at recombination must have been the same everywhere, homogeneous, to a remarkable degree. Yet regions of the cosmic microwave background origin separated in the sky by just 1.5 arc seconds were causally disconnected at that time. So they could not have come into thermal equilibrium had they started at different temperatures. Why was the universe so homogeneous at recombination? Why would such an extraordinarily violent event like the Big Bang result in an extremely uniform temperature distribution? That is the horizon problem. Again, per Crowther's 2019 review, From this Newtonian schema universe perspective, even if we discover some fundamental laws or a theory of everything, not only would we be left asking why these laws rather than some other ones, but we'd also be beleaguered by the initial conditions of the universe at the Big Bang defining dynamical explanations in terms of any prior state. Instead, from the Lagrangian schema universe perspective, there is nothing particularly mysterious or sacred about the initial conditions at the Big Bang, because 
the conditions at any point in space time globally constrain the conditions at the other points of space time. The character of the explanation thus shifts and can be captured by the slogan, everything is the way it is because everything is the way it is in accordance with the adynamical global constraint. These mysteries arise because the time evolved bias of our anti view demands dynamical explanation. And a dynamical story about the universe traced backwards in time leads ultimately to conditions in the very early universe. The key to avoiding this explanatory problem is to relegate dynamical explanation based on time evolved stories to secondary, non fundamental status and accept that the more general block universe explanation based on an adynamical global constraint is truly fundamental. This is a dynamical explanation for the Lagrangian scheme of universe. In this more general a dynamical explanation, Einstein's equations are understood as an a dynamical global constraint, that is, a self consistency criterion for the metric and stress energy tensor in space time, as I explained in the previous episode. While time evolved stories can certainly be told in general relativity solutions, there well may be events in a general relativity solution that resist such dynamical explanation. For example, the origin of the universe, or the question why were things that way and not any other. In those cases, we just have to accept that reality is best understood adynamically, in spatio-temporally holistic fashion, block universe. Again, think of a crossword puzzle, rather than a game of chess. Of course, one could ask, why is there space time at all? And certainly one could engage in speculation concerning space time with metric stress energy tensor configurations and or adynamical global constraints that do not represent our experience. Uh, such counterfactual speculation wouldn't lend itself to empiricism by definition, but I wouldn't condemn it as an unworthy academic exercise either. The point is that while we speak of doing physics from the all at once view, there is no literal view from nowhere from which to ask why does the entire relational block universe exist? Such questions presuppose the dynamical perspective, and the only answer one can give to such questions will be in terms of counterfactual constraints and alternative metric stress energy tensor configurations. That is, answers residing outside the purview of empirical science. In the next episode, I'll introduce time travel paradoxes that result from a dynamical understanding of general relativity and show how they are also adynamically resolved beyond the dynamical universe.